Great. Okay. Well, Layla Salazar Lopez. We uh, met each other a few years ago at the Psychedelic Science Conference in Oakland, where you guys are based, Amazon Watch. Um, I can imagine that your uh, that your life has been a little bit chaotic in the past few weeks, month or so, as the Amazon has been tragically being destroyed. We can dive into the whys and, and hows and, and what's going on there. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for what you and your organization are, is doing, are doing. It's, um, it's extremely disturbing for us to see what's going on, being that we're so closely tied to the Amazon at Soltara and uh, have lots of friends and, and, and connections down there, especially in the indigenous community. And, um, and so it's been really heartbreaking for us to see all this going on. I mean, even just since the day that Bolsonaro got elected, but of course it didn't all start with him. Um, so for you, it must be terrible. The fact that you're so intimately involved and, and in, in the know about all the stuff that's going on there. So, um, yeah, what's, uh, maybe, maybe you can start off by introducing yourself and Amazon watch and letting, letting the, the viewers and listeners know what you guys are up to over there. Sure. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for the invitation and hello to everyone. Um, yes, my name is Leila Salazar Lopez and I'm Chicana Latina from California, Southern California. Now living in the San Francisco Bay where our office is for Amazon watch and Amazon Watch, uh, since 1996, has been working to protect the Amazon rainforest and our global climate by working directly uh, with indigenous peoples across the Amazon basin. And our theory of change is basically that indigenous peoples for thousands of years have been protecting the Amazon rainforest and their territories are the best protected throughout the Amazon. So. Um, we work directly with them in long-term partnerships. We work directly with them in supporting their solutions to um, indigenous-led conservation, to climate justice, to basically defending their rights and their territories. And by doing that, we're protecting rainforests and rivers and our global climate. So yeah, the last couple weeks have been very intense. Um, and, you know, I guess I should back up and say the last eight months have been very intense, but with the election of uh, Jair Bolsonaro into um, um, as a Brazilian president. But yes, as soon as the story of the Amazon fires kind of broke in the international media, um, not only were we inundated with requests from the international media to find out what was going on, um, we were also um, inundated with requests from our partners and then also from the global community basically saying, I'm, you know, I'm seeing this, what can I do? So while it's devastating, you know, it's, it's been, um, there's been a lot of heartbreak and a lot of tears, you know, seeing the images come out of the forest and, um, and seeing the impacts that these fires have, have caused. It's also been really reassuring, um, a, a glimmer of hope that the global community is now alerted to this emergency. It's, it, it didn't start on August 24th. It started you know, weeks and months before that. Um, but just to give some background, you know, there's, there's people who are saying, you know, there's fires all the time in the Amazon. <clears throat> and yes, that's true. But not like, not at this scale. Um, there's been an 84% increase in fires across the Amazon from Brazil to Bolivia to Peru to Venezuela. There's fires across the Amazon 
In Brazil alone, there's been over 74,000 fires. Just in the month of August, there were 9,500 fires on indigenous territories. So, you know, when, we, when I just remember, when I say the best protected forests are indigenous people's lands and, you know, to know that there are, you know, close to 10,000 fires on over 100 indigenous people's lands, it's, it's, it's devastating. Um, so fires are, are, these, response. <laughs> are these fires okay so I, I looked at i guess uh, or somewhere i saw some stats going back maybe 10 years about how many fires there are so it's definitely it's something that happens every year mm -hmm. but these fires i wonder are they um intentionally set and are they burning through old growth forest or are these like the slash and burn kind of fires that uh that that ranchers are it's it's an old practice that, that they've been doing and um and and what is the situation down there in terms of the fires mm -hmm. well in brazil in particular um Many of the fires have been intentionally set. Um, there was actually a fire day announced by, um, by ranchers in the state of Pará on August 10th. It was a day to go out and set fire to lands, which are degraded lands and also forested lands. Um, because the Amazon is an ecosystem, whether it's degraded, which means, you know, forest land that has been already cut down, it might be turned into grassland, it might have been a soy plantation, it might have been, you know, where cattle was grazing. Um, regardless, to set fire to that land and, and cause um, fire and smoke, it has a ripple effect, you know, across the Amazon as an ecosystem. It turns the Amazon from a carbon sink into a carbon polluter um and so yes you know there have always been fires for you know for as long as we can remember um and in fact the fire season is just beginning so the images that you see of the fires raging across the amazon it's pretty well known and expected that this is just the beginning um the fire season usually goes until october november so the good thing is that the world is watching and there's a lot of pressure on, you know, the governments and the corporations, which I'll talk a little bit about, to, to stop this um, and to respond directly to the fires that are taking place right now on indigenous and non-indigenous land. Um, when I say these, this is not an accident. You know, these are fires that are intentionally set for the most part. And the reason why there is a, you know, a doubling, an increase in the amount of fires in, in Brazil in particular is because of the um, encouragement by the Brazilian president. And that's, that's, that's not a, uh, I don't say that lightly. I mean, literally the Brazilian president, president has spoken um, in very derogatory and very racist ways um, towards indigenous peoples and their lands. I mean, he's literally, I mean, he ran on a campaign saying, you know, the Amazon is for development. We're gonna take away lands. There's too few people for that much land. We're gonna take it away. I mean, I, some of the things that he has said are irrepeatable and completely racist and the harmful rhetoric that he spews emboldens uh, people to go out and not only burn, but take people's land. And that is, um, you know, what, what his, what he and his Congress have, have done. Not only is he saying this, but his words have turned into action. Literally at the moment he took office, he gutted, FUNAI, which is the, um, uh, the agency to protect indigenous peoples. He gutted IBAMA, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency. When I say gutted, it means defunded. 
and also merged ministries, the environmental and the agri agriculture ministry. Literally gave the agriculture ministry um, power over the indigenous, uh, or the um, environmental ministry and defunded it. And so there isn't enough funding and support for forest guards as there was in the past to monitor and implement the forest code or environmental protections because Brazil has very strong environmental laws. And until recently did have There's just no one to enforce them. They're just not enforcing now there's, there's no one to enforce illegal logging or, you know, people setting fire. Who's all of this is being done with impunity. And so, you know, you know, a, a few days after the story of the fire broke in late August, you know, President Bolsonaro was forced to respond um, because there was an international outcry and also the G7 meeting, um, other international leaders were questioning what is happening with the fires, including President Macron from France. International aid was offered to stop the fires. And, um, and President Bolsonaro was forced to say he cared about the Amazon and was going to do something about it, was going to send in the military. Um, this is a former military general saying he's going to militarize the Amazon to stop the fires. That's not the solution. The solution is to immediately refund and support the agencies that are Brazilian government agencies that are supposed to be doing their job to protect the forest and the indigenous peoples. While the fires, he's rejected aid from countries that have um, offered. And his Congress, which is completely supported by the agribusiness lobby, their plan is to develop the Amazon and destroy it for agribusiness and mining and industrial extraction. They literally just last week were in Congress talking about rolling back demarcation of indigenous people's lands. So their intention is to destroy the Amazon. Their intention is not to protect it in any way. And that is very disturbing. Uh, <laughs> that's very disturbing. It's uh, that's I think what's so mind blowing about this whole thing is that we're not working with forces that are out of our control, right? We're not. We're not like this is not some random event. This is a willful, intentional, deliberate act of destruction, and it's yeah. calculated and coordinated. Exactly. And it's 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 so dangerous to the entire world. I mean, mm -hmm. and they're using the excuse, well, well, you guys messed up, so now, so so why can't we mess up too? Yeah, I mean, the the, the reality is Brazil is, um, you know, because Brazil, um, because of Brazil's economic crisis, you know, Jair Bolsonaro ran on a platform of stability, you know, creating stability in the country and creating jobs and security. And for people who don't live in the Amazon, you know, the Amazon seems so far away. Um, and the, but the reality is, you know, whether you're in Rio, Sao Paulo or California or Canada, we're all connected to the Amazon. We're all connected to the Amazon. We all know that to, you know, to, to protect our future and our climate, we have to protect forests, the Amazon, the boreal, the Congo, Southeast Asia. Forests are the lungs of the earth. And we need them standing. The remaining forests on this planet need to remain standing. The Amazon is the biggest, the largest tropical rainforest. And not only is it the biggest and most biodiverse, um, it's extremely culturally diverse, and it is one of the global stabilizers of our weather system. And so any remaining forest that's standing, we need to ensure that it remains standing. And so that's what we're really focusing right now is, yes, we have to focus on the fires, the immediate response to the fires, and tell the truth about how they were caused and who's responsible and who is profiting from this. Because it's the government, yes. It's the government that is emboldening people to set fire to the, to the forest and destroy it. But who's behind that? Um, it's industry. It's agribusiness. It's mining. There's companies like Cargill 
and ADM and JBS is the biggest meat producer. There's banks and financiers like Santander and J, um, JP Morgan Chase and asset managers like BlackRock and State Street. These companies are benefiting from this. And we, the good thing, the good sign is that um, we put out this call saying, you know, there's, there's a handful of companies that could do something right now to stop this. We put out a list of a dirty dozen, and that includes some of the companies I just mentioned, um, including also Costco and Walmart, because they source products. They, they source high-risk commodities like soy and cattle um, from, from the forest. And so we're calling on these companies to immediately cease um, sourcing these commodities until they can prove that they're deforestation free and to not be doing business with Brazilian agribusiness and governments should not be doing business with, with Brazil as long as they continue to let the forest burn. Um, and so this is what is actually putting a little bit of pressure on Brazil right now. Um, there are companies um, that are responding and saying, we're not sourcing you know, H&M, we're not sourcing leather from Brazil anymore. You know, Timberland and Vans and North Face, we're not, we're not doing business with, you know, our supplier anymore until they can prove that, that, you know, where they're sourcing from places that are responsible and not burning down the rainforest. And there's Norwegian funds and every day there's more, there's more expression of concern um, by, um, companies and governments and we need to continue this and civil society is also putting pressure on Brazil and other um, Amazonian governments as well. Um, that's one of the roles, uh, important roles of organizations like Amazon Watch is to bring our allies together, you know, other um, Amazon Watch and other NGO allies um, have responded to the call by the indigenous movement in Brazil, in particular, the um, association, the articulation of indigenous peoples of Brazil have called for international support and solidarity outside of Brazil, because they're doing everything they can on the ground. They're, they have been resisting for, you know, we could say the last eight months, or we could say over 500 years. They've been resisting. They have been resisting this um, colonization and encroachment and destruction of their territories and their rights for hundreds of years. But um, since Bolsonaro has been elected, the indigenous movement has been, the indigenous movement, the women's movement, the Afro-Brazilian movement, the landless people, I mean, all across Brazil, there's, there's so much resistance to these threats, but they need international support. And so we worked, um, just last week, we worked with, um, to support a PB's call, and um, we worked with um, Extinction Rebellion around the world to organize and put out a call for um, actions, for prayers, for, you know, silent vigils, whatever people could do on that day on September 5th to take action for the Amazon. And there were, I'm, I'm really, really happy to say that over 50 actions took place in 20 countries on that one day. And that also sends a message to Brazil and to the companies who are complicit because people went to Brazilian embassies and consulates, but they also went to the headquarters of companies like BlackRock. And that's, um, that's what civil society can do. We can sign petitions and we can sign pledges to the governments and the companies, but we could also take action on, on days like this. And there will be many more. There's, this is not, the Global Day of Action was one, one day and we'll continue to organize events and actions for people to, to respond and keep the pressure up on these, on the governments and the companies. How far of a reach do these Amazon products have in the world, the Brazilian beef, Brazilian leather, Brazilian soybeans. And um, 
how can how can uh, consumers determine what products contain these things if they are interested in avoiding them? Um, so just backing up a little bit, I mentioned the Dirty Dozen, um, which if you go to our website, amazonwatch.org slash amazonfires, you'll see kind of various different ways to, you know, to learn more, to take action. And one of the ways to take action is to look at the Dirty Dozen list. And um, those are some of the companies that I mentioned, like Leclerc, Stop and Shop, Walmart, and Costco. Those are some, some name brand, you know, commercial um, retailers that, you know, anyone could say, you know, question them and or stop shopping there. Um, and then there's banks. Um, such as BlackRock and J.P. Morgan Chase, Santander, BMP Paraibas, HSBC. Um, those are kind of the direct ones that we can list and encourage you know anyone just to either take their money out of, not buy from them, write them letters. Um, but in you know, it's not um, you know, there's not like a made in Brazil label that says this is from the rainforest. Um, you know, there's a lot of entities that source from other suppliers and it would be very, very hard to know exactly where they're getting all their products from. We put out a report um, in April with APB, with the um, Articulation of Indigenous Peoples of Brazil, that's called Complicity and Destruction. And that lists, um, gives us a background to um, who the agribusiness lobby is in Brazil and what companies they're connected to. It's a, it's a pretty extensive report. Um, and these companies that I mentioned are some of the companies that, um, that were, were named um, in that report. And what I could do, you know, it's, it's. Is that report doing, on the website? Doing, yes. You could go to amazonwatch.org and look under our reports. It's there. Um, we're trying to make it easy for everyone to be able to take action, right? Like that's why, you know, you can go through our report and there's hundreds of companies. It's not just one, it's not just 12 companies, but we narrowed it down to 12 so that, you know, those are some, no, those are retailers. Those are banks you know, that a lot of us are connected to. So we could do something about that. Um, you know, there have been calls by, um, the, the, Brazilian indigenous movement to boycott any Brazilian products, to boycott um, high risk commodities, they're saying. Um, and high risk commodities are the ones that you mentioned. We're talking about soy, cattle, um, you know, leather products from cattle, beef, um, timber, um, because those are products that you cannot, commodities that you cannot guarantee are coming from that are deforestation free. You cannot guarantee that they're deforestation free or they're, they're um, sourced responsibly without human rights violations. So those are the ones that we're really focusing on. And so I encourage people to go to our website to find out more about that. I do, I would be remiss to, to um, if I didn't mention that, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about Brazil. That's where the attention has been. But the fires are not only taking place in Brazil. Um, one of the biggest fires is actually in the Chiquitano forest on the border of Peru and Bolivia, on the border of Bolivia and Brazil. Over 2 million acres have burned just in the Chiquitano forest. This year this, alone? This year alone, just over the last couple months. And this is also a... It, this is also done in response to um, expansion of agribusiness into the forest, which is very unfortunate, especially since uh, um, the Bolivian government uplifts the rights of nature and uplifts indigenous rights. But when it comes to expanding um, 
the expanding economy, they're looking at agribusiness. And that means people setting fire to primary rainforests and indigenous lands to make way for cattle. Um, in Venezuela, this is, we've recently just started to get um, no, notice that there's also many fires raging in, on the border of Venezuela and Brazil. Um, and it's not just fires. We're also talking about intentional plans to develop rainforests and extract, continue to extract resources from the rainforest. In the Western Amazon, in Ecuador and Peru, there are extensive plans for oil and gas development and mining development. Um, and so I think it's important to also mention that there's fires and there's also continued threats. There's continued threats to rainforests in Ecuador and Peru for palm oil plantations, for oil and gas, for mining, for roads. And these are really major threats that might not be a fire burning, but um, they will cause, if implemented, if moved forward, they will cause massive rainforest degradation and deforestation and violations of human rights. So we're also continuing our work in addition to responding directly to the fires and the on the ground um, urgent responses that are needed. Um, we're obviously doing our advocacy work to target the companies and the governments and make sure that indigenous peoples are at important um, um, events like the UN Climate Week coming up in a week. Um, but we also need to continue the work to amplify the threats across the Amazon, such as in the Western Amazon. Um, and not forget about that because those are those are ongoing. That's uh, that's disturbing. It just seems you know if if you pay attention to what's going on um, environmentally around the world in so many cases, it just seems like these things are just mounting. The stresses are are mounting uh, as the population grows and as people consume more. Then just the search for minerals and resources and I mean it just it it seems like a beast that is very powerful well yeah I mean if you you know we've gotten lots of messages saying the Amazon you know I'm so glad that you're you know responding to the Amazon fire emergency but there's fires in the boreal there's four fires in the Congo there's you know we get we're getting messages from Malaysia saying there's fires here we have to wear um, masks we can't breathe um, the, 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 the glaciers are melting. Um, so it's not a, this is what I would say, and I think many of our colleagues and friends, you know, indigenous wisdom keepers, scientists would all agree that we're not talking about the climate emergency and the climate crisis in 10 years. It's here now. And so, um, you know, there's been 25 years of climate talks and, you know, we, we have a Paris climate agreement that doesn't talk about extraction. It still allows polluters to pollute and it still requires the minimum action that will not give our children any kind of future. And so that's why, you know, there's young people that are not taking that and there's young people like Greta Thunberg from Sweden who have inspired a movement. You know, young people were saying, we don't, we, we can't wait another 10 years, 25 years. We need to take action now. And, you know, thank the creator for her, for, you know, starting to, you know, take action upon herself and inspiring young people around the world to demand climate action immediately. And, and, you know, in a few days, in a week, there's going to be a global youth climate strike. And, you know, whether you have children or not, you know, the children are calling upon us to support them on that day, to go on strike with the children of the world on the youth climate strike next Friday, to join Greta Thunberg in New York or anywhere you're at and join them and join their strike because they're going to be the leaders of tomorrow. They're inheriting this mess and they're doing everything possible to, to respond and put pressure on the governments to not sit in another 
10 years of dialogue because we don't have that time. Um, the, you, you know, the IPCC report last November gave a very clear warning. We have 10 to 12 years to turn around this climate emergency. The, you know, the global scientists gave their biological assessment report saying we're in a massive extinction crisis right now and we need to turn things around and the warnings are there <laughs> and it's it's really time for us to really take action and um because um you know i think most of your audience is also a spiritual community it is important for us to also pray and really pray deeply for Mother Earth and all the relatives, all the creatures of the world. For humanity, we need to pray for humanity because we're the ones who have caused this. We need to pray for Mother Earth and all life on Mother Earth because it's really, really under threat. And on the Global Day of Action, there were calls for um, Global Days of Prayer the Huni Queen people of um, Brazil, um, they put out a, a beautiful call for prayer, for a synchronized prayer, and not just for the Global Day of Action, but for every day. Every day at, you know, at certain times, 11-11, 9-11, various different times throughout the day, they're asking people to pray. Um, and that collective synchronized prayer is also a way that we could also take action. And I believe in the power of prayer, and I think that, and I also believe in the power of action, and we need to do both. How can people learn more about the youth climate strike and, um, and possibly participate in that? I'm going to pull up the exact website, but I'm pretty sure it's just globalclimatestrike.org. Let me just look it up real quick. I know it's um, in San Francisco, we have, it's a website called Youth Versus Apocalypse for all the um, San Francisco events. But yes, the global climate strike begins on September 20th, and it's a week of actions um, from September 20th through 27th. It's called globalclimatestrike.net. You could use, literally go on globalclimatestrike.net and um, look up your zip code, your country, and find out where actions are happening. There are thousands of actions happening all around the world. Um, so I really encourage everyone to, you know, to check that out and do whatever you can, whether it's from your home or out in the streets joining the youth. Are there any other international, like, so the international community has responded um, in a concerned way, it seems, at least verbally, from various governments. I know there was the, the, the French president mm -hmm. who offered aid. Canada offered some aid. Mm -hmm. um, is there any further, more uh, effective, perhaps, legal action or... I mean, this is under the charge of Brazil, yes, mm -hmm. and some of the other countries in mm -hmm. South America, but it really is a global national heritage. And I'm wondering if, if there are these uh, industries and perhaps even government-backed um, mercenaries, mm -hmm that are going into indigenous communities or, or murdering environmental people down there. Um, there have been hundreds of murders this year in Brazil of environmental activists. Is there any way for the international community to be a little more forceful about protection? I mean, is there any way we can, we can, I don't know, uh, zone and protect the like a, a, a certain part of the forest like for well, good i i mean um yes 
I mean, it's, it's complicated, but yes. I mean, the, the rhetoric of the Brazilian government is the Amazon is ours. We're going to do what we're going to do. You know, you know, the international community and NGOs, they want to take away the Amazon. No, <laughs> we want to protect it because we know that it is the Amazon is of global importance. It is beyond borders. But yes, we have to respect Brazil and all the other Amazonian countries' sovereignty. Um, actually, last week, um, last Friday, a week ago, um, presidents and high-level ministers from all the Amazon countries met in Leticia, Colombia, and they made a pact called the Leticia Pact to protect the Amazon. And they basically agreed, you know, there needs to be collective um, cooperation between the Amazon countries to protect the Amazon. Um, and they had done this through an Amazon cooperation treaty many decades ago. They signed a pact. Um, unfortunately, the good thing is that it's promising that they met specifically to talk about the Amazon. I mean, presidents went. Um, Bolsonaro did not go, but he sent his Minister of Foreign Relations. Um, but all the other presidents, um, from the Amazon, Amazonian countries um, attended, except for Bolsonaro and Maduro, or, or um, the Venezuelan leaders <laughs> did not go. They were not invited um, for many reasons we all know. Um, but it was promising that they got together. However, they failed to create the urgency that was needed to really say, you know, the Amazon is on fire and we need to collectively send all, all of our government firefighting sources and the world to go fight these fires. They didn't do that. They did not talk about the industrial threats to the Amazon and how to, you know, resolve those, those, those situations. Because for Ecuador, for example, why do they want to continue drilling into the most biodiverse rainforest on the planet, which is Yasuni National Park and everything that surrounds it. Why are they threatening indigenous people's territories throughout the southern Ecuadorian Amazon, northern Peruvian Amazon? Because they're in debt to China. They're over $20 billion in debt to China. And so, and they owe China in oil. And so, you know, we have to think bigger. We have to think a lot bigger about this kind of system that has put these companies, these governments in this situation where they feel like the only thing they could do is extract their resources to pay off debt. If the Amazon is truly of global importance and the global community needs to come together to resolve this debt, to come together to say, we need to really, you know, do collectively do our part to protect the rainforest. In the Western Amazon, we have an initiative called the Sacred Headwaters Initiative, which brings together indigenous peoples and organizations and nationalities from Ecuador and Peru to permanently protect 60 million acres of rainforest territories and keep them free from industrial extraction. It's an initiative, it's a vision, it's a proposal to the Ecuadorian and Peruvian governments. There's other initiatives in Colombia, for example, um, that actually the president of Colombia, Duque, did talk about last week. It's an initiative called the Triple, Andy, Triple A Corridor, the Andes Amazon Atlantic Corridor. They call it the, 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 the Anaconda Corridor because it's basically from Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, all the way to the, from the Andes to the Atlantic, a huge area of land that could be protected and governments are talking about it, but they're not implementing it. And the first thing they say is they don't have resources. So the global community can come together with resources to, um, to protect these forests. And those are not conversations that can only be had with indigenous peoples or NGOs. They need to be had at the government level. And um, there's companies that can help as well. Instead of investing in destruction, they can invest in protection. Take Amazon.com, for example. They're using the Amazon's name. They're making billions of dollars every day. 
they could contribute funds to these governments and specifically and directly to indigenous peoples to protect their forests. But they need to also be encouraged and pressured. I'm just saying Amazon as an example because you know they're using the Amazon name, they could give back. They have the resources to give back. Um, but as I mentioned, um, the UN, um, because of you know, President Macron from France's um, statements at the G7, there were other responses by other countries. Canada, Chile did offer aid. And there's also, there's a call for governments to talk about the Amazon at the next, um, the UN um, General Assembly coming up. So, you know, I mentioned the climate strike on the 20th. The reason why the climate strike is on the 20th is because the UN General Assembly is meeting the following week in New York. And the UN Secretary General has called for a, a, an emergency climate summit. And they will be talking about the Amazon. And there is a lot of interest um, by world governments to talk about the Amazon in particular. And, you know, a lot of, you know, the issues that we're dealing with have been caused by governments. And so it is their responsibility to respond, but it's also the responsibility of the global community, the global civil society, you and me, all of us to continue to sound the alarm, continue to amplify the importance of the Amazon rainforest and the biodiversity and the, um, and really support the true protectors of the rainforest who are the indigenous people who have been protecting the rainforest and biodiversity and um, spirits for thousands of years. And, you know, I think it is upon us, um, you know, those of us who do benefit from healing from the Amazon, that um, we, you know, we've received a lot of support from the medicine plants and from, you know, the spirit of the forest. And it is our time to, to give back and to reciprocate, re reciprocate that, that support that the Amazon has given all of us and that love, you know, for those of us who are connected to the forest and love the forest and are connected to the people and love the people, this is, this is really the time to, to step up and do whatever we can to, to protect the Amazon. Well, that's just what we are asking from our community to do with this, with this, video and, and with this campaign that we're running and and we're also going to step up um you know we're a new uh a new company we're we're not making any money yet but we still feel it is our um it is our responsibility to give back to i mean we wouldn't we simply wouldn't even be around if it wasn't for the medicine plants and for the indigenous people who work with and for the traditions that have developed over uh centuries so of course you know um we are uh, well we have been since since the beginning doing our best to support the indigenous communities that we work with and make sure that a, a, a fair share of of the the resources that that pass through our hands go back to them right and um and not trying to take the uh not trying to let's say appropriate the cultural traditions um by replacing them as the stewards and the servers of the the medicine the providers of the medicine um and now you know well, we're always conscious of of that. Uh, well, we're always conscious of the Amazon. Right now, has just shaken us all up a lot and really called into question. You know, like like how committed are we? You know, how committed are we to the jungle? How how committed are we to the indigenous people we work with? And so we are. Um, you know, we're we're stepping up. And Thank you. We'll continue to step up. Um, how exactly 
are the indigenous communities of the Amazon working to protect the forest? Well, very simply the, and most urgently, um, indigenous peoples across the Amazon and indigenous peoples, nationalities, their organizations and movements are standing strong in defense of their rainforests, their rights, and their territories. Um, and their rainforests are their territories. They're their ancestral territories that have, you know, they've been protecting for thousands of years. Indigenous peoples have um, rights under their own constitutions, have um, rights under international law. Um, and in some country, Amazonian countries, it's, 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 their territories are protected by ancestral territory. Others, there's, in, like in Peru, it's title. So in Peru, for example, you know, there are efforts by the Achuar and Wampis people, for example, they're already at the highest levels of court in, in Peru. So they're taking legal strategies to challenge those titles and get ancestral territory recognized like in Ecuador. In Ecuador, um, just, I mean, it wasn't that long ago. It was in the early 90s where they went on strike. They, they conducted, you know, marches across the country, literally shut down the country to demand their rights and territories. And as a result, they were, they gained their ancestral territories. So the Achuar people got recognition to thousands of acres of land that was their ancestral land. The Quechua people of Sarayaku have ancestral title to over 100,000 hectares of land. The Zapata, over 200,000 hectares of land. You know, the, the, the Waurani have thousands of hectares of land, plus the intangible zone where the uncontacted peoples live. These are just examples. So they're protecting their territories. They're protecting their, legally protecting their rights. And by protecting their rights, they're protecting their land and territories, which means protecting the rainforest. Um, in many cases, governments and corporations are in violation of those rights and those laws. And then that's where you get cases, legal cases that have to be filed, um, you know, on the ground resistance and international campaigns um, to support, um, you know, demands to get oil companies like Geopark out of Achuar territory or Andes Petroleum out of um, Zapata territory in, in Ecuador or, you know, get ADM and Bungie and Cargill to you know, implement their zero deforestation policies that they've adopted. So, um, you know, just recently in Brazil, there was a first ever, just the first week of August, the first ever indigenous women's march um, to demand um, protection of their lives, their rights, and their territories. And it's really important that we say lives because, as you mentioned, Brazil is actually the most dangerous place to be a land defender, indigenous and non-indigenous. If you're an environmental activist in Brazil, it is very dangerous to speak out. And that's why um, it's really important that the international community stand with them um, you know, both on the ground, internationally, at the international fora. You, speaking of the international community, you also mentioned the governments of the world. You also mentioned uh, debt to China. Um, historically, I don't think China has a very good uh, environmental record, not in their own country and not abroad. The different resource extraction projects that they fund and that that they're involved with, not many countries do. Mm -hmm. um, that said, they are the leading producer of solar power and renewable power in the world. Mm -hmm. Yet, still, of course, are now a, a massive buyer of all of these soybeans and beef products that are being now are not available from the u.s because of the tariffs that that uh mr trump has placed on soybeans and other agricultural products mm -hmm. so that demand has shifted to the amazon 
because that's the next best place to get those things. So what is your viewpoint on, on what China's doing and considering those different points in the world? Yeah, I mean, China has a not a great track record for environmental and human rights protection. Um, however, um, they internally in, in China were very committed to reducing emissions. What we need to do is encourage China to expand that commitment to its overseas investments. And we're engaging as much as possible um, on this, but we have a long way to go. And so, um, you know, there are, you know, Chinese state companies that are, um, Andes Petroleum, for example, is a state oil company. There's um, companies, for example, that built the Three Gorges Dam. You know, they're also interested in dam building and um, um, creating industrial waterways in the Brazilian Amazon to transport soy and commodities. Um, fortunately, some of these projects that I just mentioned have been stopped and have been delayed, and most of it is because of finance. So that's part of the reason right now that while we engage with companies and we engage with governments, we also have to engage with the financiers because if they don't have the money to build their projects, if they don't have the insurance for these projects, they can't build them. So there's various different levers and, um, you know, we gotta, we gotta try all the different angles and strategies to um, engage China and um, other governments who, who do have direct impact in the Amazon. What about, um, so looking at the world as it is today with a couple hundred different nation state actors that are trying to manage the territory within their own artificial borders um, but really with a lack of of in-depth global cooperation of real global cooperation not looking at the world as in this is the system that we have these are our hard borders and we should be looking at at the, the world's resource inventory, the world's resource demand, um, the population, and how to manage that in a way that's not just sustainable, but regenerative and ideal for our own society, for future societies. Mm -hmm. We really need to be, you know, that's really kind of the vision of this, you know, you know, when we, think about, you know, all these issues and problems and the destruction, we need to be thinking of not just stopping, but what's the opposite of that? What do we want to be? We want to stop the destruction. We, want, we have to resist that and stop that. We don't want it to get worse, but we need the alternatives and we do have them. We have the alternatives, you know, when people say, well, you know, how can the indigenous people help? It's like, well, they've been helping for thousands of years. If you stop going into their lands and stop violating their rights, they will actually continue to protect the forests and the spirits to keep the forest alive. Their vision is a good life. The, that's the most basic thing is buen vivir, living well. What is living well? Having the basics of life, having clean water, having clean air, having forests, having plants and animals, having food, having family, having love and support. That's a good life, having good education and good health care for your, for your family and your community. You know, that Buen Vivir is a, not just a saying, it's a, it's a vision for how to live in balance and in harmony with each other and with Mother Earth. And 
Buen Vivir is actually in the constitution of Bolivia, of Ecuador. It, and now it's time to implement that. That is a different way of, it's a different worldview than this current economic system and model that we've been under that continues to destroy and harm and pollute. And so that's the past vision. That's the vision of people 100 years ago. And we are transcending that right now. We're going through it right now. And the politicians and governments who want, and companies who want to stick to that are living in the past. And the young people are reminding us that that's not what they want. They want to live. They want to pr protect life and future. And that's what we need to be really focusing on. We have to stop the, the bad and stop the destruction, but we need to focus on the future. We need to focus on pr protecting life and protecting forests and regenerating forests and restoring. And not just restoring landscapes, but restoring hope. Because yeah, when we talk about these things, it starts to feel kind of daunting and hopeless. But there are so many wonderful examples, um, whether you look at the Project Drawdown or whether you look at you know, the youth movement or you look at the spiritual movements, there's so many different positive ways that we can be promoting climate justice and a just transition to a new economy that isn't just for the 1%, that's for you and me, that's for you know, the majority of the people. You know, the, the majority of the people do want clean air and clean water and, and you know, want public, uh, public buses that are run on clean energy and want electrification of, of, you know, the public transportation system and get off fossil fuels. The majority of the people in Brazil and the Amazon want to protect the Amazon and don't want it to be destroyed. So let's work on that. <laughs> on protecting rather than destroying and move towards an economy and a system that protects life, not destroy it. Yeah. Um, wow. Talk about hopeless. Uh, I've, I've really, really been struggling as of late. Um, just you've got, you've got what's happening in the Amazon. I mean, there's, it's happening all over the world, Sumatra, Indonesia, um, are, are being burnt for, for plantations, you know, of course, all the news about the climate. I mean, you see it here. I live in Costa Rica. Every year the droughts are getting worse and worse and worse during the dry season. Even just walking around where we are in this beautifully forested area, the trees are all 50 years old when they should be 500 years old because, because settlers came and, and the people, the local people just indiscriminately cut down the forest for for export for lumber for cattle ranching um and so yes it's it it does feel overwhelming at times does feel hopeless at times but you know you did mention there are also areas that that do provide hope that uh that um do give a glimmer of, of a bright future. You mentioned a few of those. One of them is um, technology, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So technology is, in, in a large part, responsible for some of the, well, a lot of the destruction that we see on the planet right now, allowing humans to consume faster and deeper into the forests and in every aspect into the earth into the mines and everything every aspect of life basically is touched by technology and that has been uh, a large part uh, as i said responsible for a lot of the environmental destruction and distress that we see in the world that said some people believe that technology can help us dig us out of this hole that there are energy technologies or alternate resource production technologies and to me that does offer some hope 
as mm -hmm. one of the areas of hope, along with all of the activism you see, along with the spiritual movements. Um, yeah. What's What's your viewpoint on on the 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 new technology revolution? Well, being that I'm here in the the, the heart of it, <laughs> in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you know, there's definitely pros and cons and it's here, you know? So, um, like you mentioned, it has its own, you know, it's a lot of issues and problems that it has brought. I would say one of the biggest is the, um, the disconnect uh, between people that it has caused it connects us like look we're we're here talking we're not in the same country and we're able to connect and talk and share and it also has created you know um ways that you know we feel like we always have to be connected and don't can't talk to the person right in front of us so um that's one of the biggest issues i see right now is the disconnect between people that um that we need to work on. Um, technology has infinite resources um, and those resources can be dedicated to um, protecting nature and you know solving some of our most urgent needs and crises. Um, you know a lot of technology has caused a lot of harm you know for example Look at the facial recognition technology that's pro provided by Amazon.com and other companies. This facial recognition technology is used to criminalize, you know, immigrants in this country, and um, you know, and separate children from their families. And I wanted to mention that because you know we're talking about some of the most horrific things happening right now, and they're promoted by governments like the United States government and you know Trump if you really you know sh you know look think about it you know Trump prides himself on separating families and you know denying climate change and Bolsonaro prides himself in calling himself the Trump of the tropics burning down the rainforest and dismissing human rights and indigenous peoples as you know, essential to protecting this, this planet. He also is a climate denier. We did not allow the climate conference to happen in Brazil this year. That's why it's happening in Chile. So it's not, you know, it's, um, it is very daunting, but, you know, we have to, we know that, you know, technology um, and the private sector has a huge role to play. You know, they don't have to only be on the side of, you know, corporate greed and, you know, the next startup. They could start up something for good. You know, there are companies that have come to us and said, hey, you know, we are working on real time mapping of Amazon destruction. We want to work with you. We have, you know, companies who, you know, are, you know, have are connected to Tesla and other companies and say, you know, we have this solar technology. We want to help provide it to your power to the protectors program to get solar on the ground in the Amazon for energy, for communications, for transport. But so there, those are, just, those are just a few examples that technology does have a lot of issues, just like many industries do. And they also can be part of the solution. Good. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> so um, you know, people like you working hard to, to try to bring about a change in society. We definitely need more of. How many people are working in Amazon Watch right now? We have 12 full-time people. And um, since the fire emergency started, um, we have hired a couple more people, consultants on the ground in Brazil. Um, we're going to be hiring more um, full-time field coordinators, indigenous coordinators in Peru and Ecuador. Um, we have additional consultants working on communications to keep the story going. And 
Um, but we're a small organization and we have um, a small team. We have some additional consultants we brought in for this immediate crisis. We do wanna hire a few more staff and we're um, also powered by volunteers and interns. So anybody who's interested in volunteering or doing an internship or lending their support in any way, please, please contact us. <laughs> and, you know, I, sh I should probably wrap up by saying that, you know, we're asking, you know, supporters to do a, a few things. One is, um, you know, keep informed about, you know, the issues and, um, um, the emergency by signing the pledge for resistance, standing with the indigenous people. Um, they put out a pledge for um, support and resistance. So sign that pledge. You can go on amazonwatch.org and sign the pledge to support the Brazilian indigenous movement. If you sign that pledge, then you'll get weekly updates from us on what you can do. Um, and then that's where you'll find out about the next days of action or when we'll be doing events. Um, in New York, or we'll be doing trips to the Amazon, et cetera. So sign the pledge and any of our other actions on our website, and then you'll get updates. And um, you can also contribute to Amazon Watch by donating. And your donations are gonna directly go to supporting our work and supporting our partners. Um, immediate urgent responses on the ground, like we've already um, regranted funds to APB and other um, indigenous organizations and nationalities in the Amazon in Brazil and Bolivia. And then we have an Amazon Protectors Fund, which is a rapid response regranting program where we respond to anything from you know, needs for travel, need to hold indigenous assemblies in their territories to promote their life plans to um, you know, additional um, support for travel, for meetings, assemblies, um, for communications, for indigenous youth media makers. So, um, you know, those are a few ways that you could directly support our work and our partners. And we're really grateful to all of you for that support and to you, Daniel, and all of your team for, you know, for inviting me and for um, supporting us and and we'll continue to be in touch and keep you updated on what we're doing. And um, we're just really grateful that you all are listening and supporting. And, you know, really it's about all of us coming together at this time to protect the Amazon and the rights of indigenous peoples and our climate um, for all of our future. So thank you. It's the least we can do and thank you. Um, so, so we'll put uh, we'll put links in here uh, that you mentioned. Um, Great. You know this is this is probably going to reach beyond our communities, but like our our Soltara community. But within our Soltara community, uh, we're going to be matching donations from our community. So um, we'll be we'll be running a campaign, you know, to our own mailing list and stuff like that, and on our own social media. But this will also be up on YouTube. So. So people will see this for, you know, months and probably years to come. Uh, so any, any donations can also go directly to Amazon Watch um, uh, at any time. So great. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. I know you're super busy. You just got back into the office. And uh, I really appreciate you uh, sitting down with us, with me. And for everything you're doing out there in the field, uh, you guys are crazy. And I'm blown away that you only have 12 people on that team because I've heard a lot about you guys in the past. <laughs> yeah, it's um, we're 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 gonna we're gonna hire a couple more people. Don't worry, <laughs> with your support. <laughs> Good. Well, sometime uh, you'll have to come down to Soltara and 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 work with the Shipibo healers at our little beachfront haven in Costa Rica. We'd love that. Next, next staff retreat. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Just let me know. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Take yeah. care. All the best. Bye. Bye.